Hello and welcome to Games Night. On tonight's agenda, the PlayStation 3, is it a success and are UK consumers getting a fair deal? The London Games Festival will be upon us in October, but why has London consistently failed to produce a world-class gaming event? Gaming broadcast rights. Will we experience restriction in video game TV coverage, or is this the best way to take gaming forward? And finally, censorship in gaming. It's always been an issue with gaming being blamed for many of society's ills, but is this justified? Yes, this is the first ever Games Night, a show that represents a new era in gaming television where you, the viewer, will have the opportunity to get involved in serious topical discussions related to the gaming industry. Each week, we'll gather a range of guests from within the many gaming communities, so there'll be no PR, bab no PR sales babble, just straight talking, gloves off discussion. Tonight, in the studio, I'm joined by Wesley Locke, writer and broadcaster for ScrewAttack.com, William Latham, Professor in Computing, Gaming and Entertainment from the Goldsmith University in London. Matt Fox, author of the recently published book, The Video Games Guide. And finally, from Team Dignitas, with over seven years experience on the pro gaming scene, Robert Haxton. So William, the PlayStation 3, is it a success or are UK consumers you know, paying too much? I think PlayStation 3 has been a bit of a surprise. Um, I know from the developer's point of view, the people who make the games, Xbox 360 is a much more easy platform to develop for, so that's going to be the first port of call. With console games costing between 8 and £15 million pounds a shot, uh, the publishers obviously were all anxious as well to get it right. So I think it has been a big surprise. I think Sony, which was very famous for innovation and doing really exciting things, maybe has taken its eye off the ball a bit. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we've got the development angle, which I know you know an awful lot about. Matt, you know, the, the cost of the, the console, do you think that's a key issue? Well, unfortunately for us, it just seems to be a fact of life that everything is more expensive in the UK than where you can get it abroad. Um, Unfortunately for Sony, it seems that the price point that they've chosen for the PlayStation 3 of £425 seems to be just a little bit higher than the majority of UK game fans are willing to pay for it. So as a result, they've started off on the back foot and um, the Nintendo Wii is outselling it almost two to one. Uh, the Xbox 360 has had time to build up a large and varied library of games. And Sony, I think, are going to have to do some price cutting before Christmas if they really want to stay in the chase. Okay, well, we've identified a couple of issues. Obviously, you know, William mentioned the development issues and stuff like that. You've got the, the cost of it. But Blu-ray as well, Wesley. I mean, that's another issue that's, that's expensive for consumers. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's £425 for the console, roughly, in the UK. You get it with an extra controller two games, uh, you get a high definition movie player with it as well. Um, I think the bad thing for Sony at the moment in a way is in the US it's only the equivalent of £250. Um, so basically for 250 quid you That's get your PS3, it's a big it? difference. You can essentially get a plane ticket over to the US, pick yourself up a console, come back and then you've got yourself the same, essentially the same thing. So I mean I think it's, it's, it's quite expensive at the moment, I think there will be a price drop before Christmas. I was tempted to do the, the US thing, um, but I understood that if you get a console out in the US then you don't get complete compatibility with the, your sort of back library of PlayStation yes. 2 games, so you've got to kind of watch out for that if you're well, thinking about it. Well, that's kind of the region coding coming into play, but I mean, I think, I think that what you get with the console is a lot. I mean, they lose a lot of money on the, on the consoles that they make. Um, so essentially, there's a lot of stuff coming out for Sony. Um, I say before the end of next year, you've got Metal Gear Solid 4. You've got Killzone 2, you've got Little Big Planet, and loads and loads of things. Plus, it's got a free online service. So, you don't have to pay £40 a year like you do for Microsoft's Xbox Live service. And what, what we've got with the Wii for online, you've got one game at the moment. So, it's, it's free, it's £425. I expect there's going to be a price drop, but there's a lot coming for it. Well, Rob, I mean, are consumers you know, in Europe being hard done by consistently, do you feel? Well, first and foremost, I want to say, Wesley, which airline do you travel with? Because that is an incredibly uh, cheap airline ticket you must be getting to America. Um, but no, it's, we are obviously paying more in Europe um, for, for the system than the Americans are, which is, uh, well, to be honest, some watchdog probably should do something about it, because um, it's, it's got to be arguably uh, infringing on 
been illegal uh, to pay that much more than Americans. Um, I know our currency is strong compared to theirs, but it's not that much stronger. Uh, on the side of the game console itself, the PS3, if, if I, as a PC gamer, because that's what, essentially what I am, if I was to go to a console, the price would be a big thing. And if the PS3 wants to capture people who maybe aren't into the console market at the moment, they will have to get uh, an entry-level price which is far lower than it is at the moment. Well, obviously, Nintendo shares are worth more now than Sony, or temporarily, according to Bloomberg. Now, PlayStation, they've dismissed this Christmas, Sony. They, they say this Christmas it's not important to us. They're, they're focusing on next year. Yeah. Well, well, like I said, they've got a lot of big games coming out between now and the end of the next year, especially between the end of next year. Um, you've got to remember that the Xbox 360 is about to come up to its third Christmas by the end of this year. Sony are only coming up to their first. Nintendo will be on their second Christmas by the end of the year. And so they, they've still got... They've still got, there's still some way behind in the amount of time the console's been out, in, especially compared to Microsoft. Nintendo are doing exceptionally well at the moment with ha great hardware sales, and um, it seems like they're going to continue to do so, especially over Christmas. A yeah. bit of damage limitation there, William. Um, yeah, I think the Sony PR mach machine is going to do a good job at publishing good news. I think if you look at PlayStation 1, they had the styling absolutely right, very sleek design, a little bit like the equivalent to, to the iPod now, you know, several years ago now, I think you know definitely they've taken the eye off the ball in terms of styling. The style of the kind of PlayStation 3 is a little bit like that obelisk in 2001. Sort of slightly, the consumer isn't entirely happy with it. I think that I think that home is going to be a big thing for Sony. They're like they're kind of like online service where it's it's essentially like you know a, a meeting point for many people. Um, you can download certain things. You can meet your friends online for games, and of course it's going to be free. Well, you've established, you know, that Sony are definitely having some ups and downs. Certainly next year is going to be a much stronger for them than uh, this year has been so far. But definitely, we know Sony are a very capable co uh, company and they're bound to do well in the end. But, Matt, moving on now, London Games Festival, you know, how do you see it? I mean, we want to play the new games first. We don't have anything like that here. I actually have to say that I'm not hugely bothered about it. You know, I go out and uh, I'll go and buy the game in the shop when it's, when it's ready, when it's a finished game. and and when it's available. So I'm not too fussed about going along to games booths and sort of having little trial goes on games that aren't quite complete yet and, and seeing all the, uh, the previews I have to offer. I, I personally think that uh, too much time is spent looking at previews in the gaming industry, just in general. The gaming press seems obsessed with previews and it, it's, it's almost like you spend too much time looking forward into the future and you know, you're I constantly think, saying, What's gonna, well, look at this console in six months' time, that's going to be great. Look at this game well, in I six months' time, that's going to be great. the needs something you know. like E3. The gaming industry needs something like E3 so they can put it across to everyone that the gaming industry is big, it's here, there's so many things you can do with it. It's not just some geek in their bedroom or whatever. It's, you know, for so many people, there's so many people who can play games. There's so many different types of games out there. And a thing like E3 shows off that kind of thing. They show off all these different kinds of games. It's a massive event. Unfortunately, it's kind of a shadow of itself now, uh, of its former self now, um, E3. And I think a big event in the UK would be fantastic, especially in getting messages out to the public about what the game industry so is there's about. There's no reason why the UK can't do it as good as anywhere else. Why, why should uh, why Germany with the games exactly, Why haven't we? So that's what we're trying to sort of establish is why is the UK, we've got Leipzig in, Germ in Germany, we've got E3 in America, uh, London's, you know, it's had ups and downs in games events, but why do we consistently fail? That's, that's to make a world class event, to attract world class you know, I, I, talent I development the key, retailers. The key thing is something like this uh, needs considerable subsidy to make it really work big time. In the US, you know, the conference industry is working very well and, and they can run the conference and make serious money from it. In the UK, to get it started, it needs some su substantial but money that's being the same put problem. into it. Pr same problem with E3. E3, basically, a lot of publishers, especially small publishers, couldn't get their games shown. So the, a lot of the money that they spend on showing their games and stuff didn't obviously like, make such a big appeal. But um, bigger companies, they said they didn't want to spend too much money. They basically all got together, said, we don't want to spend too much money on this thing. And it's a big shame because E3 was such a big event. And to have something like E3 here would be phenomenal. But I we don't have it. Where's the responsibility, though? Is it with publishers, governing bodies? Well, I, I don't really understand the, the full economics of the gaming industry because it is a huge monster. But the British gaming industry is, is third in the world behind America and Japan. So you know, if we can't do a really good show, then it just seems bonkers to me, doesn't it? I mean, hopefully this London Game Festival in October is going to be really good and, and 
we can all go along and have a great time there. Yeah, I mean, certainly right now they're listing dozens of events happening, but I'm not certain that we all know what they are. Indeed, the, you know, we've been talking to companies and they don't know themselves even though they're invited. So, um, I, think, I think there needs to be a clear distinction between a consumer event, which needs to be what E3 finally became, a, a big show for all the basketball stars and all the sports drivers and things of that sort, and a business show. And I think w if everyone knew which each of them was, it'd be a lot easier for everyone. I think if the UK got an event similar to like E3, well, especially how it was, where the public can go in, they can look at all these different types of games, they can see what Sony are making, what Microsoft are making, what Nintendo are making, and they, they can have a look around, see all these games. And it's something we don't have, which I think would be great if we did. I mean, there's video games live, but I didn't even know it was on last but year. Again, do we not, we, ha we have the information, we have the uh, magazines that go off to the various events around the world, so we're not lacking the information. So would another trade show on on top of the ones we already have, just saturate the industry. Would I say as much as I'd like the UK to have a trade show? Would would that be too much for the actual I market to sustain? I don't, I don't think so. I just think that people want to go along. They want to see games. There's nothing better than seeing that trailer for that game that you've been waiting for for ages, or even getting a chance to play on a game that you're like, oh, I've been really wanting to play this. And um, I think the UK would really, really do well with a big event, E3 style gaming event, where everyone can go along and have a look what's available. But to make it work, the, the the consumer would need to be charged £100 to get in well, to really? financially. That's the publisher's problem, not mine. I think this country also yeah. suffers from the problem that if it's not in London, uh, the events don't matter. And London is obviously one of the mo world's most expensive cities to stage anything like this. Well, I can see that's going to run, but it's time for a break now. But when we come back, we'll be discussing games broadcast rights. Will video gaming eventually be going the same way as the Premiership? And we'll also be talking uh, about everyone's favourite topic, censorship in gaming. See you shortly. Welcome back to Games Night, a show that represents a new era in gaming television where you, the viewer, will have the opportunity to get involved in serious topical discussions relating to the gaming industry. If you've missed any of the topics already dis discussed tonight, you'll be able to join the debate on our website at www.xleague.tv. Now, to move on to our next subject, which is gaming broadcast rights. Robert, you know, now you've seen shows like Championship Gaming Series, buying the rights to games, well, what's your views on this? Well, first and foremost, the CGS is going to change the entire competitive gaming scene. You can't throw that much money at the competitive uh, scene and not revolutionise it. There is millions and millions of dollars going into the CGS and it started off in America, it's very well established over there, but now it's spreading across the entire world, South America, Europe, Asia. There's going to be CGS teams everywhere. Now, in terms of the uh, exclusive rights, very controversial. Obviously, it means other tournaments that obviously play the games like Counter-Strike Source will no longer be able to broadcast those games. Now, effectively, that will probably kill those tournaments, and it means those players who have previously participated, possibly for years, at these events will have nowhere to go. The only place they will have to go is to the CGS. Now, if you get into the CGS, it's brilliant. You get £15,000 minimum. If you actually uh, win some games, you get even more than that. Now, for a gamer, that's an astronomical amount of money. So, so even if you're a loser, you still get 15,000 a year? You, you, 15,000 is the minimum. Now, for a gamer, it's an unbelievable dream to achieve that amount of money. And it's what we all aspire to almost, to have a sustainable income. So from that perspective, the CGS is positive. But for the most gamers, it means they'll be left out in the cold. Yeah, I mean, this is really going to change the competitive scene. It's going to be like the Premiership. We, we get a, a form of elitist uh, area in gaming. This, this could sort of divide it in some way, or it could even cancel other competitions altogether, because you can't play a Halo competition if the Halo rights have been bought. It could, it could affect them and the teams. So does that create like a sort of monopoly then for like the like exclusive rights? Or? It does, uh, but at the same time, you, you can't ignore the fact that it could be a positive for the esports scene as a whole. At the end of the day, they will produce these programs with the amount of money they've got, obviously, to what is hopefully be a very high standard. And that will raise the bar for any event around the world. But, but it's only certain games. What, what, so, what sort of games can you expect to see? I mean, Well, for the CGS at the moment, it's going to be Counter-Strike Source, uh, FIFA, Dead and Alive, and uh, what's the last one I've gotten? Project Gotham Racing. But what does this mean for everybody so else? Matt, what, do you, what do you make of it all, though? I mean, competitive gaming, esports, I know you're not the, it's not your core area, but what do you make no, of it? When it comes to esports and competitive gaming, I feel like I'm very much on the outside looking in. 
I purely ga play games for enjoyment and uh, any sort of competitive element is sort of round the sofa with my brothers and my buddies. But I've always been interested in esports, um, ever since 10 years ago when um, news of Dennis Fong, aka Thresh, um, winning John Carmack's $100,000 Ferrari in a, um, in a Quake tournament, uh, you know, that kind of got me interested in it. I thought, wow, you know, some guys getting minted playing video games, how great is that? You know, what a fantastic career. Um, it's not something that I've ever sort of dived into, and I really take my hat off to, to Rob for what he's achieved in it. But, is that because and, you're bad at video games, or...? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I would stand two seconds in the, in, in the video game arena with Rob over here. You know, I have kind of play a big variety of video games, so I don't kind of get the expertise at any single one. But, um, uh, and, you know, and kudos also to XLE TV for sort of bringing this up to the masses in, in the UK. Well, th well, that's it. I mean, I, I actually, also it's, a, it's a sign of an industry maturing. So, it, you know, we're seeing in-game advertising, we're seeing kind of Warcraft millionaires, we're seeing Linden dollars. What we're seeing is the consumer is starting to, you know, generate money from playing games. And I think it probably is an indication of games starting to go mainstream. But but it's crossing it, say crossing it. Over. The one thing there is, though, you use the word maturing. Yeah. That is a key term because this opportunity for those gamers who get into the CGS is a lot of money f and they'll have a lot of time in their hands because obviously they probably won't be doing anything else with their time because they'll be concentrating so fully on yeah. their CGS activities. They have a responsibility not to waste it. They need to be seen to be professional. They can't. The media will focus on this. They need to be shown that they're putting the time in. They need to be doing the uh, media and publicity work around their actual competitions well. And if they do it well, it will bode well for the future of gamers everywhere. But what about those who've been playing games together for years and, like, say, a couple of the members of one team get into CGS, but the others don't? What does that mean for them? Does that mean? Well, again, if you get into CGS, it's good. If you don't, it could be very, very bad. So it could be, it could be an issue. For, so for the two people who make it to CGS, it's good. For the 100,000 that don't, it's bad. Where does the responsibility lie for those last 100,000 people? Well, you know, no, they should, just go, the they should just go and play other games and make money from those. Yeah. You know, there, there are plenty of games out there, you know, online games, massive multiplayer worlds. Um, you know, the, What's great now, there's a, there's a wide variety of different types of games that players can play. And I think also the contracts are only one year, so that there's opportunity in a year's time for someone else to step into the shoes of the players today. And I think it's worth stressing that <laughs> competitive gamers, sorry, competitive gamers are a tiny, tiny minority. At the end of the day, at the end of the day we all know gamers play games because they enjoy the games. And that won't change. Someone might have the exclusive rights, but you can still play your game. You can still enjoy it. You said that um, CGS would raise the bar for esports. Do you think it will also raise the profile and sort of help esports as a general thing rather than just what they're actually doing? Well, the uh, CGS in the UK will be shown on Sky One, which is, again, obviously the, the main Sky channel. And that exposure, obviously, it's going to have to get a large audience to make it viable. But if it achieves it, then that's you know, mainstream penetration, and that's what esports is looking for. Well, certainly we've got a lot to learn on this subject. Again, it's going to run and run. CGS, it's new, it's big, it, you know, it's great to have more gaming on TV, but we've all got a lot to learn from it, and so have the publishers and the gamers as well. But Wesley, we're moving on to gaming censorship now. Um, now, it's always been a sensitive subject in games. It frustrates many. Why are games, you know, games seemingly misunderstood in this way? Well, I just, I just think that um, games are a lot different to how they were a few years ago. Um, even, even three years ago, ten years ago, games are changing all the time. But it dates back to, to the days of, of the original Mortal Kombat, censorship started with that kind of thing, and Night Trap fiasco, those kind of things. And they, they just seem to continue and it seems to develop into bigger issues nowadays, especially with things like Manhunt uh, 2, which was effectively banned recently. Um, they had the whole um, Resistance Fall of Man and the Manchester Cathedral kind of fiasco, and they wanted that game pulled to the shelves uh, just because it has um, one guy in the 1950s shooting a few spider-style aliens. That's an interesting point as well, because obviously, you know, we had 1976 movie The Omen, uh, Gregory yeah. Peck there stabbing his son, getting shot on an altar. Yeah. We have, uh, even in you know, mainstream films, Steven Spielberg film, A War of the Worlds, Church is Destroyed. When it, we don't see the same reaction, do we? I mean, it's... Well, the, game's the, 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 the issue of censorship in games is complicated. When I, I was making, uh, with my team, The Thing, PlayStation 2 game, uh, some of you, I think, played, um, ended up being a big hit, but the, the censorship issues were very complicated. For, like, for Germany, you can't have red blood, it has to be green blood. For the Japanese version, uh, we had flamethrowers in the game and the, you couldn't have characters on fire for more than two seconds. For the European version it was five seconds, ten seconds was okay. So censorship is very different for each of the territories. 
the, the publishers are very smart. They know exactly what is appropriate for each territory. And in Rockstar, they kind of had it coming. They, they deliberately baited the, the censors um, by deliberately making a game that was going to offend. So I think it, it's a complex issue. The, the publishers know a lot about it, and there's no reason why they can't well, produce games to work within the censorship The game's the called censorship Resistance Fall of Man, not Resistance Fall of Manchester Cathedral. So it's not like it's like trying to take down like Manchester Cathedral, kill but, but the innocent issue, people. The, or the issue with, with Manchester Cathedral was, wasn't just the use of a religious building, but no. it was also the copyright on the building it being was, infringed. It, well, the, uh, yeah. Sony thinks that they got all, all they needed to get in, res, in regards to copyright and permission for that. It was more about the, the um, gun culture in Manchester, which they were worried about, and thinking that if kids are going to be playing games which have got guns in Manchester Cathedral, what does that say about games? But the thing is, I mean, you know, what's people who play Resistance Fall of Man going to do? It's not going to encourage children to pick up a gun unless they're scared some alien menace is going to come down. So. I think we can put it plainly and simply. In playing a video game in which you shoot someone does not provide any sort of excuse for going out and shooting someone in real life. That is not a viable defence. It is not the game's fault. It is your fault. You are a nutter. But I think to deny any kind of cause and effect might be wishful thinking as well because it's documented fact that when the deer hunt was released, the uh, incidence of Russian roulette rose dramatically in the US. So we have to prevent some, you know, the monkey see, monkey do element. And I think that we do need the uh, age rating system to really sort of make sure that we can shield children from games that yeah, are a bit controversial. But there's, there's another, uh, I think one of the problems is feature films like Saw and Hellraiser and things like that, you know, pretty severe content. I think, you know, definitely there is, I think there needs to be a lot more research done. There is an well, argument that well, actually I, I, computer games keep people out of trouble because they take up so much time. I'm an adult. So I can watch instead of stuff getting like into Saw. fights, they're actually just playing computer games. So actually it's a very good way of using up time when people could be getting I'll into say, trouble. I'm sure there's been research done which actually shows that people that commit violent offences, in terms of their interests, they've been shown to be more a fan of movies than they have of video games. Well, so if anything, the movie industry should be under greater scrutiny. Not that I'm saying it should be. But equally, the uh, link between uh, games and their negative effects on us, uh, the public, is greatly over-exaggerated. Well, I've, I've watched films like Saw and Hostel. Why could I not be allowed to play Manhunt 2? I mean, surely it'd be my decision. I'm an adult. I mean, I'm in my mid-twenties. Um, through playing, I play video games my whole life. I've only killed about six people. So, I mean, that's not too bad, considering I've been playing video games my whole life. I mean, I'd like to know what it is about Manhunt 2 itself that made that game get banned over... Manhunt. What, what's so different well, about Manhunt 2 than Manhunt? The thing is, Wesley, everyone sets the bar slightly differently when it comes to on-screen violence. And, you know, if you, you can watch, obviously, films like Saw and it doesn't affect you, whereas someone else might watch something and might find Casino Royale torture scene far too traumatic to take. So everyone sets the bar different heights, so it's down to the ratings council to sort of, you know... But what's the chances you know, of them wanting to play Manhunt? I mean, you know, we don't know... I mean, I've not played Manhunt 2, so I don't know what it is about the game. I think it's a very complicated issue, you know, the, the way you know weapons are used in warfare is very similar to a computer game. It's crosshair on a screen, so I, you know I think it's a very complex area. I think no one can really have a definite opinion. I think what's got to be a lot of money is going to be ploughed into research and then some firm, very firm guidelines that publishers have to follow. I don't need to fall out of it. A video game though can teach me to be a killer. Don't teach me to, to shoot a weapon better. I mean, may, may if it does, I'd be so good at Formula One, I'd be the world champion in the world. Um, so. But there, as, as you said earlier, there, there is a possibility of inspiring a certain mimicry of uh, events you've seen in games. Or, why why or would it be so games? different from films? Is it because films are passive? Or? Well, in a computer uh, game, you're in control. That's the difference. There, it's, it's, a it's, it's not a gun. There's an interaction going on there, which isn't going on in films, though. There's an immersion. It, in a decision-making process, which mm. you don't get in a feature film. So it's a different experience. Also, so that, that's why it's such a hot topic. The, there's, it is a a definite there's a statement that video games are for kids. You know, and that's a widely held viewpoint from a lot of people. That's in key, actually. Yeah. I, 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 I think, think, the I think is, don't play them. Yeah. I, think, I think the thing is, um, they're scared that kids are going to get hold of Manhunt too. I mean, I think, though, that kids are too busy happy-slapping people to worry about Manhunt, but that's me. Well, so definitely. You, I mean, well, yeah, it's a huge topic. You know, it's um, probably too sensitive an area to go into too much detail. But I you know, think the, there are two sides to the kids getting hold of uh, illicit games. One side is can they actually buy them in the store, and thanks to the age rating on the box now, that's hopefully a bit hard for them to do. Uh, the other aspect is can they actually play them at home? I mean, a video game is roughly around ten hours of entertainment, so the I would have thought the parents might point. notice. You know, their parents I think, should take an interest and see what the kids are playing. That, and, um, 
the publishers have got so you know they've invested you know forty million dollars in a game you know including marketing the last thing they wanted doing pulled so I think with the the manhunt thing they're going to play a lot more safe now to make sure their titles aren't pulled at the last. I think with manhunt well, guys, I'm going to have to hold you there because this debate obviously again is going to go on and on. Censorship in video gaming is here to stay, but we're going to have to see what happens again. Discuss it on the forum. Well, that's all. That's it from all of us at Games Night. I'll end by thanking all of my guests for their candid opinions and a reminder that you, the viewer have the ability to influence this show. We want your input and you can do that by emailing us on gamesnight at xleague.tv or by posting your points of view on the xleague.tv Games Night forum where you will also have the opportunity to continue tonight's discussions. That's it for now. I've been Alan Boyston and on behalf of everyone at Games Night, it's good night. This has been a Portland Interactive production for xleague.tv.